chapter one of more about pixie this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by judy mason more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey chapter one a new neighbor the night nurse was dusting the room preparatory to going off duty for the day and sylvia was lying on her water-bed watching her movements with gloomy disapproving eyes for four long weeks ever since the crisis had passed and she had come back to consciousness of her surroundings she had watched the same proceeding morning after morning until its details had become almost unbearably wearisome to her weak nerves first of all came mary to sweep the floor she went down on her knees and swept up the dust with a small hand brush and however carefully she might begin it was quite quite certain that she would end by knocking up against the legs of the bed and giving a jar and shock to the quivering inmate then she would depart and nurse would take the ornaments off the mantelpiece flick the duster over them and put them back in the wrong places it did not seem of the least importance to her whether the blue vase stood in the centre or at the side but sylvia had a dozen reasons for wishing to have it in exactly one position and no other she liked to see its graceful shape and rich colouring reflected in the mirror which hung immediately beneath the gas bracket if it were moved to the left it spoiled her view of a tiny water-colour painting which was one of her greatest treasures while if it stood on the right it ousted the greatest treasure of all the silver-framed portrait of the dear darling most beloved of fathers who was afar off at the other side of the world tea-planting in ceylon sylvia was too weak to protest but she burrowed down among the clothes and moped to herself in good old typhoid fashion wish she would leave it alone wish people wouldn't bother about the room don't care if it is dusty wish i could be left in peace don't believe i shall ever be better don't believe my temperature ever will go down don't care if it doesn't wish father were to come home and talk and cheer me up <laughs> the tears trickled down and splashed saltly against her lips but she kept her sobs under control for crying was a luxury which was forbidden by the authorities and could only be indulged in by stealth the night nurse thought that the patient had fallen asleep but when she went off duty and her successor arrived she cast a suspicious glance at the humped-up bedclothes and turned them down with a gentle but determined hand crying again she cried oh come now i can't allow that what are you crying about on such a lovely bright morning when you've had such a good night's rest i had a horrid night couldn't sleep a bit i feel so miserable wailed the patient dolefully i'm so tired of being in bed you won't have very much longer of it now your temperature is lower than it has ever been this morning you ought to be in good spirits instead of crying in this silly way come now cheer up i'm not going to allow such a doleful face i'm very cheerful when i'm well ask aunt margaret if i'm not i've a most lively disposition everyone says so whined sylvia dismally i'm tired of everything and everybody so would you be if you'd been in bed for two months tired of me as well as the rest yes i am you are a nasty horrid strict cross thing 
but a smile struggled through the tears and a thin hand stole out from beneath the clothes and pressed the white-sleeved arms in eloquent contradiction whatever sylvia was tired of it was certainly not this gentle sweet-faced little woman who humanly speaking had brought her back from the verge of the grave she snoodled her head along the pillow so as to lean it against the nurse's shoulder and said in weak disconnected snatches i'm sorry i'm so horrid i feel so cross and low-spirited i want a change can't you think of something nice you're going to have some beautiful chicken soup for your lunch it is in a perfect jelly hate chicken soup hate the sight of soup want to have salmon and cucumber and ice creams and nice rich puddings nurse laughed complacently <laughs> oh so you shall some day glad you feel well enough to want them now would you like to be carried to the sofa by the window for an hour this afternoon while your bed is being aired and made comfortable i think it would do you good to lie in the sunshine and the doctor could help me to carry you it would be quite exciting to see a glimpse of the outer world wouldn't it rather i can't believe that everything is still going on just the same are all the neighbours alive still is the old man at the corner alive has the little girl at number five grown up and put on long frocks i feel as if i had been lying here for years and years i believe i have grown grey myself give me a hand glass whitey let me see how i look whitey walked obediently across the room and brought back the silver-backed glass from the dressing-table she was accustomed to her nickname by this time and was indeed rather proud of it than otherwise she had been known successively as spirit of the day and the white nurse during the hours of delirium and the abbreviation had a natural girlish ring about it which was a herald of returning health there look at yourself miss conceit she cried laughingly and sylvia held the glass erect in both hands and stared curiously at her own reflection she saw a thin clear-cut little face with arched eyebrows large brown eyes an aquiline nose and full pouting lips the cheeks showed delicate hollows beneath the cheekbones and the eyes looked tired and heavy otherwise there was no startling change to record i don't look as much older as i expected but i've got a different expression whitey a sort of starved wolf haggard tired outlook just exactly like i feel aren't i beautifully thin it's always been my ambition to be slim and willowy like the people in fashion plates i shall be quite a vision of elegance shan't i whitey hm well said whitey vaguely you must expect to look very slight after lying in bed for so long but it doesn't matter about that you won't trouble about appearances so long as you feel well and strong again yes i shall said the invalid stubbornly she turned her head on one side and stared intently at the long plaits of hair which trailed over the pillow her kenwigs as she had dubbed them after charles dickens's immortal miss kenwigses who are pictorially represented in short frocks pantaloons and tight plaits of hair secured at the ends by bows of ribbons my kenwigs look very thin she said anxiously i used to have three thick coils people's hair doesn't come out after typhoid fever does it whitey i shall be furious if mine does oh hair generally comes out a little in autumn replied whitey easily now you have looked at yourself quite long enough i will put back the glass and prepare some food while your aunt comes to see you but i shall tell her not to talk too much for the doctor won't let you be moved if you are looking tired and exhausted 
sylvia sighed to herself for interviews with aunt margaret were a decided trial in these days of convalescence when every nerve seemed on edge and ready to be jarred she was nearly twenty-two and for the first year after leaving school the dear old dad had been in england and she had had the most delightful time travelling about with him he always declared that he was a poor man that tea was doing so disgracefully badly that he expected to retire into the workhouse in the course of the next year but all the same he never appeared to be short of money and the travelling was done in the most comfortable and luxurious of fashions sylvia was his only child and in his eyes was the most beautiful and accomplished creature in the world so that it was a trying experience to be domiciled with an elderly maiden aunt whose ideas were as early victorian as her furniture who had forgotten what it felt like to be young and was continually aggrieved because her niece had not learned to be old during the long year of idleness sylvia had cherished the idea that her father would take her back to ceylon where she would reign as queen of the bungalow charm the hearts of the coolies by her beauty and dignity pay frequent visits to candy and become one of the favourites of society but when it came to the point it appeared that he had no intention of the sort in two or three years he hoped to be able to settle in england and meantime his ambition for his daughter demanded that she should remain at home and devote her time to music for which she showed an unusual talent if he had other reasons he kept them to himself but as a matter of fact he dreaded a possible marriage abroad which would condemn the girl to a life of separation from so much that is good and pleasant and if any qualms arose as to the cheerfulness of the home in which he was leaving her he consoled himself by the reflection that he would be able to make up for temporary deprivations in the years to come mr trevor sailed off to the east and sylvia took up her abode at number six rutland road in an unfashionable suburb in the north of london and settled down to being a good industrious girl with what grace she might she did not understand aunt margaret and aunt margaret felt it a decided trial to have her sleepy home invaded by a restless young creature who was never so happy as when she was singing at the pitch of her voice rushing up and down stairs and playing silly schoolboy tricks but fate had ordained that they were to live together and they had jogged along more or less peacefully until that unlucky day when the girl had sickened for her dangerous illness then indeed aunt margaret realized that she had grown to love her wayward charge and all the manifold demands and inconveniences of illness were swallowed up in anxiety during the first anxious weeks she allowed not only one but two of those dreadful nurses to take possession of her spare rooms submitted meekly to their orders and saw her domestic rules and regulations put aside without a murmur of protest but when the crisis was safely passed and recovery became only a matter of time the old fussy nature reasserted itself and her eyes were open to behold the dire results of a long illness this bright october morning she came stooping into sylvia's bedroom a slight woman with a narrow bent back brown hair smoothed neatly down on each side of a withered dried-up face with a patch of red on the cheekbones and sunken brown eyes roving restlessly to right and left she wore a black stuff dress a satin apron with pockets and an edging of jet and knitted mittens over her wrists a typical old lady of the ancient type yet as she stood beside the bed there was a curious likeness to be observed between her face and the one on the pillow and sylvia recognized as much and felt a thrill of dismay at the thought that some day she too would be frail and bent and wear a cap and mittens and have rheumatic joints and attacks of bronchitis if by chance she was so imprudent as to go out without putting on galoshes a woolen crossover and a big silk muffler beneath her mantle 
to one and twenty it seemed an appalling prospect and one to be shunted into the background with all possible speed well my love and how are you this morning much better i hear a good drop in temperature said aunt margaret pecking her niece's cheek with her lips and answering her own question without waiting for a reply as her custom was nurse tells me that you will soon be up again and i'm sure it is time this room needs a regular spring cleaning and as for the new drugget on the landing three new spots of milk this morning to say nothing of what has gone before if i had known you were going to be ill i would have made the old one last another year for it is sheer waste of money buying new things to have them ruined in six months the last one was down thirteen years and looked very little worse than this does now father will buy you another you must put it down as one of the expenses he won't mind so long as i get better said the invalid wearily whereupon aunt margaret drew herself up with an air of wounded pride indeed my dear your poor father will have enough to do to pay all the doctors and nurses without being called upon for extras i am willing to bear my own share though i will say my stair carpets have had as much wear and tear in the last two months as in half a dozen years before and that nurse ellen is a most careless creature she leaves everything in a muddle if you get up my dear you must wear my wadded jacket i had a young friend she was the cousin of sarah wedderburn who lived in stanhope terrace and married young johnson of sunderland you've heard me speak of the johnsons who were at school with your aunt emma sylvia blinked her eyelids in a non-committal manner which might be taken either for assent or denial she was afraid to confess ignorance of the johnson family lest aunt margaret's love of biography should take a further flight in order to recall sarah wedderburn's cousin to her remembrance and what did she do she queried weakly don't tell me anything gruesome please aunt because i feel so low-spirited this morning that i can't bear anything depressing i should be very sorry to depress you my dear nothing is farther from my wishes and if she had been careful nothing need have happened her sister told me it was all her own fault for not being sufficiently wrapped up i'll tell you the whole story another day when there's more time for now i must go out to do my housekeeping these meals will be the death of me the cloth is never off the table i quite expect mary will give notice at the end of the month and goodness knows what we shall do then for it seems impossible to get hold of respectable girls the milk bill has just come in for the month ruinous ruinous now my love you must really cheer up and try to look more like yourself perhaps i shall find you on the sofa when i come back tell nurse not to use my best cushions your own pillows will do perfectly well she bustled out of the room and sylvia stared into space with a doleful face it's all very well to ask me to be cheerful when she tells me in the same breath that i'm ruining her and her beloved furniture i'm sure i didn't want to be ill if dad were at home he would never reproach me the tears were very near falling once more but just at that moment there came the sound of a manly footstep and in walked the doctor large stout beaming a very incarnation of health and good spirits well and so nurse tells me you think of going to the seaside to-day you are getting tired of yourself and want to change eh? i don't wonder at that you think you would enjoy having a little peep at the world again let me feel your pulse and see if i can allow it the pulse was quite satisfactory so nurse and doctor promptly set to work to spread blankets on the couch draw forward screens to prevent possibility of draught and bank up pillows to allow a glimpse of the road beneath 
then sylvia clasped her arms tightly round the nurse's neck the doctor raised her feet there was a moment's dizzy confusion while her eyes swam and her ears hummed and there she lay on the sofa as at the end of a long and arduous journey while her attendants wrapped her up in blankets and eiderdowns and looked anxiously to see how she had borne the exertion the little face was very white but bright with pleasure and excitement and the offer of smelling salts and cordials was laughed aside with good-natured contempt no no i'm all right just a little breathless after that whirl through space how funny the room looks i've looked at it broadway so long that i can't recognize it from this point of view is that the water-bed what a strange-looking thing just like a lot of hot bottles joined together it is comfortable over here i'd like to stay all day oh oh here's the butcher's cart how lovely it is to see the world again the jovial-looking doctor shrugged his shoulders as he took his departure the poor child must have been in sad straits indeed if she found the sight of a butcher's cart so exciting he would have enjoyed sitting beside her and listening to her rhapsodies but was obliged to hurry off to other patients while whitey seated herself beside the couch and began hemming strips of muslin to be made into those starched cap strings which were tied so jauntily beneath her chin oh whitey cried sylvia i feel better already it all looks so bright and cheerful and alive i'm simply dying to go out for a drive and to see the people walking about i used to think this such a dull little road but now it seems quite gay and fashionable i've seen three perambulators already to say nothing of the butcher's cart i wish the number seven lady would go out for a walk and let me see her autumn clothes she wears all the colors of the rainbow and looks like a walking kaleidoscope whitey oh whitey the weak voice rose to a squeal of excitement and the nurse bent forward curiously to discover the reason of so much agitation to the ordinary eye however there was nothing to be seen for sylvia's outstretched hand pointed to a semi-detached villa in no way distinguished from the rest of the row it's taken she cried number three is taken it has been empty for a year and i've simply longed for someone to come for it is the most convenient house to watch and i take such interest in the neighbours it's pretty lonely for me here for i haven't a single girl friend father kept me at school in brussels for the sake of learning the language but almost all the girls were french or american and none of them live in london aunt margaret introduced me to some young friends when i first arrived but i thought they were horrid prigs and i suppose they thought i was mad so the friendship didn't progress i amuse myself with my music and in dreaming of the time when father comes home but every time a house changes hands i have a wild hope that there will be a girl in the family who would be lively and jolly like myself i'm very nice when i'm well whitey i am really you needn't laugh like that i dare say you would be fractious yourself if you had to lie in bed for months and months and had an old griffin to mount guard over you who made you eat against your will and bullied you from morning till night what was i talking about last oh yes i wanted to ask if you had seen anything of these new people and what they were like i haven't had much time for looking out of the window but i have seen a young lady and gentleman going out and in i think they are a newly married couple for they look very juvenile and affectionate he is dark and handsome and she is fair and i should say very pretty sylvia's face clouded with disappointment oh bother the husband she won't want me or any one else to interrupt the duet i do wish it could have been a family with a daughter the curtains don't look newly married whitey no they don't i thought that myself the house doesn't look as smart and fresh as one expects under the circumstances but perhaps they're not well off and had to be content with what they could get you should not lead to the conclusion that she won't want you brides often feel very lonely through the day when their husbands are in the city 
and i should think she would be delighted to have a friend of her own age so near at hand we will watch and see if we can get a glimpse of her she is almost sure to have gone out for a walk this fine morning and if so she will come home in time for lunch from that moment sylvia's eyes were glued to the window and every woman between the ages of sixteen and sixty was in turn heralded as the bride and scornfully laughed aside by the nurse i told you that she was young and pretty she repeated laughingly i didn't mean that she was a schoolgirl or a middle-aged woman if she's coming at all she'll be here within the next half hour so lie still and rest and i'll play sister anne for you ten minutes passed twenty minutes thirty minutes and whitey was beginning to hint at a return to bed when at last the longed-for figure hove in sight sylvia raised herself on her pillows and peered eagerly forward her scarlet dressing-jacket making a brilliant patch of colour against the background of white she saw a slight graceful figure clad in a tightly fitting black cloth costume and a mass of flaxen hair beneath a sailor hat and even as she looked the girl raised her head and stared upward with eager interest she had a delicate oval face and grey-blue eyes beneath thoughtful brows but at the sight of the invalid the whole face flashed into sunshine and the lips curled into a smile of such irrepressible rejoicing which was more eloquent than words the next moment her head was lowered and she walked demurely up the path dividing the little gardens while sylvia lay back on her pillows a quiver with excitement oh oh the darling what a perfect duck of a darling did you see her smile didn't she look glad to see me whitey why did she look so pleased what can she know about me my dear has she seen the doctor's carriage drive up at all hours of the day and two nurses going in and out to say nothing of the bark which was laid down on the road she must have known that someone was seriously ill and no doubt the servants have told her that it was a young girl like herself yes it was delightful to see her you won't have any better congratulation on your recovery than that smile whitey she's in black brides don't wear black they were obliged to wear it sometimes dear you can't lay down a rule about such things she looks too young to be married she ought to play about with me for a year or two first i hate that man for taking her from me that's the girl i should marry myself if i had a chance do find out what her name is whitey mary is sure to know for she gossips with the other servants while she's cleaning the steps yes i'll go back to bed now i'm tired and i don't care to see anyone else i'll go to sleep and dream about that smile end of chapter one chapter two of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain an unexpected visitor aunt margaret can you tell me anything about the people who have come to number three i saw the lady coming in just now while i was sitting up and i do so want to know her have you been to call while i was ill miss munns crossed her hands on her lap and looked the image of dignified reproach my dear do you suppose i have had the leisure for social engagements i know nothing about the people except that their blinds are invariably crooked and every one drawn up to a different length most untidy the house looks a dear friend of mine used to say mary appleford whose father was the clergyman in my old home in leicestershire charming old man who married lady evelyn bruce most aristocratic family mary always declared that she could judge a woman's character by the appearance of her windows judged from that standpoint i should not feel disposed to call on the mistress of number three 
but you haven't seen her aunt if you did you could not help loving her she looked so delighted to see me sitting up and gave me such a delicious smile smiled at you do you say a most unladylike thing to do the first advances should come from our side as she would know if she had any experience of society i hope my dear that you were not so foolish as to respond one cannot be too careful about strangers in this big wicked city i shall never forget my poor dear cousin telling me how she called upon a most superior-looking lady who came to live in the same terrace and two months later the police raided the house and it turned out that the husband made false coins in the back kitchen and the wife circulated them among the tradesfolk so awkward for maria sylvia brought her eyebrows together in a frown and tossed about on her pillow she felt irritated and disappointed and that made her head ache and the headache sent down her spirits again and eclipsed the brightness of the morning if aunt margaret refused to call she could not make the acquaintance of the fair unknown and it would be a tantalizing experience to see her every day and yet be as far removed from friendship as if they lived a dozen miles apart during the weeks which followed nurse and patient kept a close watch on the little house over the road and were rewarded by witnessing several interesting domestic scenes on saturday afternoon for instance edwin came home early to show himself in his turn he was tall dark and handsome dressed in the height of fashion and bore himself with such an air of complacency and benign patronage towards his fellows that he looked far more like a prince of the blood than an ordinary city man he carried a little bunch of flowers in his hand and whistled as he drew near the gate in orthodox newly married fashion and the pretty girl flew to the door and nodded her head at him in happy welcome he bent down to kiss her and she took the flowers and sniffed at them lovingly then they walked together down the little path to examine the growth of some sooty chrysanthemums and three struggling creepers placed against the house edwin shook his head after the inspection as though it had been far from promising and then instead of looking disappointed they both laughed turned round and round to look over their twelve-yard domain and laughed again as if it were the best joke in the world then angelina said something in a low aside whereupon edwin strolled to the gate and in the most casual manner looked up the road and down the road and then straight across at the window where the invalid lay she told him to look cried sylvia breathlessly and her pale cheeks flushed until they were almost as red as the dressing jacket itself he is very handsome whitey i don't dislike him as much as i expected oh dear they look disgustingly happy i am sure they don't want me a bit and i want them dreadfully he doesn't seem the sort of man to coin false money does he do please casually remark to aunt margaret how very nice and distinguished they look it's my one object in life at present to make her call upon them the next day the situation developed still further for a form was seen seated at a window who must of course be edwin yet he looked strangely younger and fairer in colouring nurse and patient debated the point hotly until presently the door opened and out came one two three masculine creatures all as like as peas in a pod except for the difference in years which divided edwin from the handsome striplings on either side they stood together in the tiny garden obviously waiting for the mistress of the house and when she did not appear the youngest of the three picked up pieces of gravel and threw them up at a bedroom window while the others whistled and beat upon the gate with their sticks angelina strolled to the window in response to these demonstrations 
and stood smiling at them while she fastened on her hat but she did not appear to hurry herself in the least nor did the brothers show any sign of annoyance at their long waiting when at long last she made her appearance there was great manoeuvring to get a place by her side and away they trotted four abreast pushing every one else off the pavement but apparently blissfully unconscious of anything unusual in the proceeding sylvia and whitey watched until the last flutter of the black dress disappeared from sight then fell to work to settle the identity of the new actors in the drama they are brothers there is no doubt about that but they can't live there whitey that wouldn't be at all newly married do you suppose they are here for the day perhaps they are in rooms in town and angelina lets them come down over sundays sometimes as a treat they seem very fond of her and quite at home i think that is the most likely explanation don't you i really think it is or they might live in the country and have come up to pay a visit and see the sights said whitey thoughtfully she was thankful to find a subject of interest in these long days of convalescence to keep her patient's mind from dwelling on depressing topics truth to tell sylvia was not getting well so quickly as had been expected and besides more serious drawbacks there were minor troubles trying enough to the girlish mind she had to learn to walk again like a baby her back ached so badly that if she tried to stoop she screamed aloud with pain and worse than all the plaits of her hair grew small and beautifully less until there was hardly anything left to plait sylvia had been proud of her hair so she grew alarmed and finally sent off in haste for her special barber to give advice and consolation in the difficulty consolation was not forthcoming however and the advice offered was by no means acceptable you can't do nothing there's nothing will be a bit of good the man said dolefully whatever you do it's bound to come the wisest thing would be to be shaved at once and give it a start sylvia fairly screamed with horror and consternation shaved she cried i i go about with a bald head a horrible bare shiny scalp i'd i'd rather die i'd rather I, I, I'd, I'd rather anything in the world. It's no use talking to me, Whitey. I will not be shaved. Very well, dear, assented Whitey easily. Then you shan't. We will just have a few inches cut off and get a lotion to rub in to help the growth. I dare say the old hair will keep on until the new appears and then you need never have the horrible experience of seeing a bald head i never should see it in any case i'd buy a wig and wear it night and day nothing would induce me to look in the glass when it was off i should never respect myself again and oh whitey even at the best the new hair will be ages growing and it will be impossible to do anything with it not at all you can wear it short and curly it would look very pretty and suit you so well whitey was aggressively cheerful but sylvia refused to be comforted it would be hateful i don't know anything more dejected looking than to see the back of a shorn head under a pretty hat i won't allow my hair to fall out and that's the end of it well perhaps it won't after all miss we must hope for the best said the barber cheerfully he and whitey talked incessantly all the time the hair-cutting was proceeding with the fond hope of distracting the girl's attention but in naughty mood she refused to listen insisted on sitting directly in front of her glass and was rewarded for her pains by catching a glimpse of a bald spot on the crown of her head which put the finishing touch of depression when the doctor arrived for his morning visit he found a most melancholy patient and held a serious consultation with nurse on the staircase before departing she seems very low and listless this morning can't you do something to cheer her up 
i am afraid we are going to have trouble with that foot and if she has to lie up again it will never do for her to get in a melancholy condition you do your best i know but she needs a change there is no reason why she should not see visitors has she no young friends who could come to have tea with her and make her laugh whitey sighed and leant against the banisters with a dejected air it is exhausting work being cheerful for two and no one would have welcomed a laughing stranger more heartily than herself the question was where was she to be found she was lamenting to me the other day that she had no girl friends she went abroad to school and has had little opportunity of making acquaintances since she came home miss munns is very conservative she does not care to associate with her neighbours there is a charming girl who has come to live opposite we watch her from the window and sylvia has been trying to persuade her aunt to call for the last three weeks but it is useless i'm sorry for she looks just the very person we want won't call won't she we'll see about that i'm not going to have my patient thrown back after all the trouble i've had with her for fifty old ladies and their prejudices you leave it to me cried the jovial doctor and tramped downstairs into the parlour to give his orders forthwith a little diplomacy a little coaxing a few words of warning to revive affectionate anxiety a good big dose of flattery and the thing was done and what was better still aunt margaret was left under the happy delusion that the projected visit was the outcome of her own inspiration she said nothing to the invalid but at half past three that afternoon she put on her woolen crossover and a black silk muffler and her best silk dolman and dear aunt sarah's sable pelerine and her sunday bonnet and new black kid gloves two sizes too big carried her tortoiseshell card-case in one hand and her umbrella in the other and sailed across the road to call at number three sylvia had gone back to bed after lunch by her own request the hair-cutting ordeal had tired her out and there was besides a deep-seated wearing pain in one foot and ankle which made her long to lie still and rest she tried to sleep and after long waiting had just arrived at that happy stage when thoughts grow misty and a gentle prickling feeling creeps up from the toes to the brain when a patriotic barrel organ began to rattle out the strains of rule britannia from the end of the road and the chance was gone then whitey read aloud for an hour but the book had come to a dull uneventful stage and the chapters dragged heavily sylvia longed for tea as an oasis in this desert of a day and dispatched nurse to bid mary bring it up half an hour before the usual time and then came a charming surprise back came whitey all smiles and dimples the tired lines wiped out of her face as by a miracle she stood in the doorway looking at her patient with dancing eyes i've brought you something better than tea she cried just look what i've brought you as she spoke she moved to the side as if to make room for another visitor and was it a dream or could it really be true there stood the bride of number three the sweet-faced angelina in her black dress her gray eyes soft with welcome oh cried sylvia shrilly oh oh she sat up in bed and stretched out two thin little hands all a-tremble with excitement it's you oh how did you come what made you come how did you know i wanted you so badly i wanted you too said the girl quickly she had a delightful voice soft and deep and musical in tone and she was prettier than ever seen close at hand best of all she was not a bit shy but as frank and outspoken as if they had been friends of years standing 
your aunt called on me this afternoon she went on coming nearer the bed and sitting down on the chair which nurse placed for her she invited me to come see you some day but i've a dislike to waiting if there's a good thing in prospect so i asked if i might come at once and here i am i'm so glad you wanted to see me i've watched you from my window ever since you first sat up in your pretty red jacket and you looked up and smiled at me i've watched you too and wanted to know you so badly i've been ill for months it seems like years and was so surprised to see that your house was taken you can't think how strange it is to creep back to life and see how everything has gone on while you have lain still it's conceited of course to expect a revolution of nature just because you are out of things yourself but i didn't seem able to help it i'm like that myself said the pretty girl pleasantly there was a soft gurgle in her voice as of laughter barely repressed and she pronounced her eyes with a faint broadening of accent which was altogether quaint and delightful sylvia mentally repeated the phrase as it sounded in her ears i'm like that myself and came to an instant conclusion irish she's irish i'm glad of that i like irish people she smiled for pure pleasure and the visitor stretched out a hand impulsively and grasped the thin fingers lying on the counterpane you poor creature i'm grieved for you tell me is your name beatrice i'm dying to know for we had a discussion about it at home and i said i was sure it was beatrice i always imagine a beatrice dark like you with brown eyes and arched eyebrows i don't the only beatrice i know is quite fair and fluffy no i am not beatrice but you are not helen i do hope you are not helen the boys guessed that and they would be so triumphant if they were right no i'm not helen either i'm sylvia trevor deed you are then it's an elegant name i never knew any one living by it before and it suits you too i like it immensely did you the grey eyes twinkled merrily did you find a nickname for me sylvia glanced at whitey and smiled demurely we called you angelina oh we didn't think that was really your name but we called you by it because you looked so happy and uh, oh affectionate and pleased with everything and we called your husband edwin to match those are the proper names for newly married couples you know the girl stared back with wide gray eyes her chin dropped and she sat suddenly bolt upright in her chair my what she gasped my her. she put her hands against her cheeks which had grown quite pink and gurgled into the merriest most infectious laughter <laughs> but i'm not married at all it's my brother he's not edwin he's jack and i'm bridgie bridget o'shaughnessy just a bit of a girl like yourself and not even engaged sylvia sank back in the bed with a great sigh of thanksgiving what a relief i was so jealous of that husband for i wanted you for myself and if you'd been married you would have been too settled down and domestic to care for me i do hope we shall be friends i'm an only child and my father is abroad and i pine to know someone of my own age i know your aunt told me we talked about you all the time for i had been so interested and sorry about your illness that i had no end of questions to ask what a dear old lady she is i envy you having her to live with i always think one misses so much if there is no old person in the house to help with advice and example the invalid moved restlessly on her pillows and cast a curious glance at her companion the grey eyes were clear and honest the sweet lips showed not the shadow of a smile it was transparently apparent that she was in earnest 
sylvia felt a pang of apprehension lest her new friend was about to turn out proper that acme of undesirable qualities to the girlish mind if that were so the future would be robbed of much of its charm but the discussion of aunt margaret and her qualities must be deferred until a greater degree of intimacy had shown bridgie the difficulties as well as the advantages of the situation in the meantime she was longing to hear a little family history and judiciously led the conversation in the desired direction you were four young people living alone then for i suppose the two younger boys are brothers also how fond they seem of you why of course they dote upon me said miss o'shaughnessy with an air of calm taking for granted which spoke volumes for the character of the family then she began to smile and the corners of her lips twisted with humorous enjoyment i wouldn't be saying that we don't have a breeze now and again just to vary the monotony but we admire one another the more for the spirit in us and it's pleasant having an even number for we can fight two against two and no unfairness maybe they are a bit more attentive than usual just now for they have been without me most of the winter poor creatures we've had a troublous time of it these last two years my dear father died the spring before last and we had to leave our home in ireland then one sister was married and another went to paris for her education so there were two trousseaux to prepare and when all the fuss and excitement was over i was worn out and the doctor said i must do nothing but rest for some months to come the boys went into lodgings while i junketed about visiting friends and they are so pleased to get into a place of their own again that they don't know how to knock about the furniture enough or make the most upset it seemed to sylvia an extraordinary manner of appreciating the delights of housekeeping and she attempted to condole with the young mistress only to be interrupted with laughing complacency deed <laughs> i don't mind let them enjoy themselves poor dears it's depressing to boy creatures to have to think about carpets and cushions and have no ease at their writing for fear of a spot of ink i care far more about seeing them happy than having the furniture spick and span what was it made for if it wasn't to be used sylvia groaned heavily wait until you have been in our drawing-room she said the chairs were originally covered in cherry-coloured rep over that is a cover of flowered chintz over that is a cover of brown holland over that is a capacious antimacassar over that each night of the week is carefully draped a linen dust sheet the carpet is covered with a drugget the ornaments are covered with glass shades the fire screen is covered with crackly oilskin even the footstools have little hoods to draw on over the beadwork i've lived here for two years and on one occasion we got down as far as the chinch stratum when cousin mary robinson and dear mrs MacNougall from aberdeen came to stay for the night but my eyes have never yet been bedazzled by the glory of the cherry-coloured rep bridgie lengthened her chin and shook her head from side to side with a comical air of humiliation oh well tidiness is a gift it runs in the family like wooden legs some have got it others haven't so they must just be resigned to their fate i'm going to see these rep covers though i'll wheedle and wheedle until one cover comes off after another and never feel that i've done credit to old ireland until i get down to the foundation she rose from her chair and held out a hand in farewell nurse said i was to stay only a few minutes as you were tired already but i may come to tea another day if you would like to have me oh do please come often you can't think how i should love it will you come for a drive with me some day when it is bright and sunny i will we could have a nice chat as we went along 
i have not told you about my sisters yet i have the dearest sisters in the world said bridgie o'shaughnessy End of chapter 2「Three of More About Pixie by Mrs. George de Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Family Portraits Bright and sunny days are not common in November, but the invalid managed to go out driving in such fine blinks as came along, and in each instance Angelina was seated by her side. The friendship was progressing with giant strides and doctor and nurse looked upon bridgie o'shaughnessy as their greatest assistant in a period of great anxiety sylvia was now able to sit up and work and read head and eyes had come back to their normal condition but the treacherous disease had left its poison in foot and ankle and the pain on movement became more and more acute it required all the cheer that the new friend could give to hearten the invalid when once more she was sent back to counterpane land with a big cage over the affected part to protect it from the bedclothes and all manner of painful and exhausting dressings to be undergone sylvia fumed and grumbled and whined she grew sulky and refused to speak she waxed angry and snapped at the nurse worst of all she lost hope and shed slow bitter tears which scalded the thin cheeks i shall never get better whitey she sobbed miserably i shan't try it's too much trouble you might as well leave me alone to die in peace it's not a question of dying my dear it's a question of healing your foot if i leave you in peace you may be lame for life how would you like that said whitey bluntly she knew her patient by this time and understood that while the idea of fading away in her youth might appear sufficiently romantic miss sylvia would find nothing attractive in the prospect of limping ungracefully through life the dressings and bandagings were endured meekly enough after that but the girl's heart was full of dread and the long dark days were hard to bear it became a rule that instead of taking the meal alone bridgie o'shaughnessy should come across the road to tea and sit an hour in the sick-room while whitey wrote letters or went out for a constitutional she came with hands full of photographs and letters and family trophies to give point to her conversation and make her dear ones live in sylvia's imagination one day there was a picture of the old home such a venerable and imposing building that aunt margaret beholding it felt her last suspicions of counterfeit coining die a natural death and gave instructions to mary that the second best tea things were to be taken upstairs whenever miss o'shaughnessy was present sylvia was impressed too but thought it very sad that any one who had lived in a castle should come down to number three rutland road she delicately hinted as much and bridgie said yes it would be hard if we took it seriously but we don't it's just like being in seaside lodgings when the smallnesses and inconveniences make part of the fun we are going home some day when jack has made his fortune and until then my brother-in-law rents the castle from us and we go over and stay with him once or twice in the year esmeralda is mistress of knock and is having it put in such terrible order that we can hardly recognize the dear old tumble-down place there is not a single broken pane in the glass houses bridgie spoke in a tone of almost incredulous admiration the while she drew a large promenade photograph from its envelope there that says Meralda, taken in the dress in which she was presented sylvia looked and gasped with surprise such a vision of beauty and elegance such billows of satin 
such lace such jewels and nodding plumes were seldom seen in this modest suburban neighbourhood she had never before had any connection with a girl who had been presented at court and the face which looked out of the photograph was as young as her own startlingly dazzlingly young your sister really how perfectly lovely and beautiful is she really as pretty as that how old is she what is her husband like is she very happy she must be very rich to have all those beautiful things she has more money than she can spend can you imagine that i can't said bridgie solemnly i asked esmeralda what it felt like to be able to get whatever she liked without asking the price and she said it was very soothing to the feelings but not nearly so exciting as when she used to make up new hats out of nothing at all and a piece of dyed ribbon she is only twenty younger than i and as beautiful as a picture geoffrey adores her she has a dear little baby boy to play with and wherever she goes people turn round to look after her so that she walks about from morning till night in a kind of triumphal procession how nice sighed sylvia enviously just what i should like no one turns around to look after me and i feel a worm every time i walk down bond street among all the horrible creatures who look nicer than i do myself people say sensible old people i mean that it is bad for the character to have everything that one wants do you think it is so in your sister's case is she spoiled by prosperity esmeralda's sister hesitated loyally unwilling to breathe a word against a member of her family she is just as loving and generous as she can be thinks of every single thing that father would have liked and makes a perfect mistress of the old place the people adore her and are in wholesome awe of her too far more so than they ever were of me the boys get cross sometimes because she expects us to do exactly what she wishes and that immediately if not sooner but it doesn't worry me i agree with all she says and then quietly go my own way and the next time we meet she has forgotten all about it she is just the least in the world inclined to be overbearing but we all have our faults and can't afford to judge each other she has been a dear sweet sister to me bridgie smoothed the tissue paper carefully over the portrait and put it back in its envelope then she picked up a smaller photograph from the table and her face glowed with tenderness and pride now she cried and her voice was as a herald's trumpet announcing the advent of the principal character upon the stage now here she comes here's pixie here's our baby sylvia sat up eagerly and held the photograph up to the light she looked at it and blinked her eyes to be sure she had seen aright she cast a swift look at bridgie's face to assure herself that she was not the victim of a practical joke she pressed her lips together to repress an exclamation of dismay she had expected to behold a vision of loveliness the superlative in the scale in which the two elder sisters made positive and comparative but what she saw was an elf-like figure sitting huddled in the depths of an armchair with tiny hands clasped together and large dilapidated boots occupying the place of honour in the foreground lank tails of hair fell to the shoulders and while the nose was of the smallest possible dimensions the mouth seemed to stretch right across the face it seemed impossible that this comical little creature could belong to such a handsome and distinguished-looking family still more so that her belongings should be proud of her rather than ashamed yet there sat bridgie all beams and expectancy her sweet lips a-tremble with tenderness that's little pixie esmeralda gave her two shillings for unpicking some old dresses and she went into the village and got photographed for my birthday present there was a travelling photographer down for a week 
and it's wonderfully like her for eighteen pence the other sixpence she spent on a frame green plush with shells at the corners esmeralda had remarks to make when i put it on the drawing-room mantelpiece and offered to give me a silver one instead bridgie smiled and shook her head with an expression which showed that the price of the green plush frame was above rubies no indeed it's not likely i will give up pixie's present she's not very like any of you sylvia said lamely she wanted to be pleasant and appreciative but could not think what on earth to say next it must be um very nice to have a little sister she's in paris you say will she be away long she's coming home for good in january geoffrey and esmeralda are going over to bring her back and she will go on with finishing lessons at home we can't do without each other any longer i feel quite sore with wanting her sometimes and she's homesick too i had a letter from her this morning would you like me to read it to you to show you what she's like please do said sylvia politely but in reality she was rather bored by the prospect it was one of aunt margaret's peculiarities that she insisted upon reading aloud the letters which she received from old lady friends and the incredible dullness of the epistles made them a trial to the patience of her lively young niece she stifled a yawn oh. as bridgie straightened the sheets of foreign note-paper and cleared her throat with prospective enjoyment <coughs> dearest darling people especially bridgie i was gladder than ever to get your letters this week because it's been raining and dull and the mud looked so homelike that it depressed my spirits therese has gone out for the day so pere and i are alone he wears white socks and a velvet jacket and sleeps all the time he told me one day that he used to be very active when he was young and that was why he liked to rest now all the week i do nosing and on sundays i repose me i teach him english but he doesn't like to talk it much because it's so difficult to be clever in a foreign language my dear i never suffered more than when i first came here and therese telling every one how amusing i was and myself sitting as dumb as a mummy i can talk quite beautifully now and wriggle about like a native i'll teach you how to shrug your shoulders and you hold up your dress quite differently in france and it's fashionable to be fat last night therese let me have two girls for souper they are called marie and julie and wear plaid dresses and combs in their hair i like them frightfully but they are very rude sometimes saying france is better than england and that we have big teeth and ugly boots then they got angry because i laughed and said england always thought she was right but that every one else knew she was a cheat and a bully and that she was the most disliked nation on earth and you are the politest says i quite composed and at that they got red in the face for i was all alone and there were two of them in their own country when they went away they kissed me and said they were sorry and that my teeth weren't big a bit and i said france was an elegant country but you couldn't wear high heels in ireland or you'd never be free of the bog it's a pity french people don't like us and i don't think they always mean exactly what they say but they make beautiful things to eat therese gives me cooking lessons out of school hours and i've lost my taste for coffee with grounds in it like we had at knock everything is as clean as if it were quite new and there is such a different smell in the houses a lonely smell it makes me long for home and you and a peat fire and all the people in the street speaking english and never as much as thinking of the tenses of verbs you're quite sure i may come home in january aren't you bridgie you are not saying it just to pacify me i'll tell you a secret once i thought of running away and coming back to you in london because i couldn't bear myself any longer i said to therese just in a careless kind of way as if i'd only thought of it that moment supposing now that a young girl was in paris and wanting to run away to her friends in england how would she set about getting there and she never suspected a bit for she said supposing that she lived in this suburb it would be quite easy to manage 
she should rest tranquil until the family were in bed and no one in the streets but thieves and robbers and then slip out of the house and walk to the station there would be no voiture but perhaps the thieves may not see her and all of them do not care about kidnapping children when she reaches the station she will take her ticket for england it costs but a few sovereigns and she has only to change twice and get through the custom house if all went well she would be in london the next morning while the poor friends in paris might cry as much as they liked they could not bring her back she seemed to think it quite easy but i was afraid of the thieves and had only three francs in my purse and that afternoon they were both awfully kind to me and pere called me chéri and therese took me to the circus the clown is called august but the principal one is english because they are the best he made english jokes and i laughed as loudly as i could to show that i understood the other people smiled with their lips don't you know the way people do when they don't understand but think it is grand to pretend i feel so stylish being english in france when i come home to london i'll be french esmeralda sent me a book and some money for christmas presents tell jack to write me a funny letter with illustrations how is the poor girl with the bark on the road we haven't a single animal in the house not even a cat i miss them frightfully do you remember when my ferret died and i filled up to cry and the major bought me a white rat for consolation health and tons of love darling from your own pixie sylvia chuckled softly from the bed <laughs> it's not a scrap like a letter she said it is just like somebody talking what a jolly little soul she seems very young doesn't she some girls of sixteen are quite young ladies pixie will always be a child said pixie's sister fondly there is something simple and trustful about her which will keep her young all her life she is so transparently honest that it never occurs to her that any one else will be different and she is the kindest most loving little creature that ever was created don't you think she looks a darling in the photograph it had come at last the dreaded question and sylvia tried her best to combine truthfulness with politeness she has very sweet eyes it is difficult to judge when you have never seen a person she she isn't exactly pretty is she pretty pixie pretty i should think not indeed cried bridgie with a heat of denial which seemed singularly out of keeping with the occasion from the manner of her reply it was evident that she considered pixie's plainness a hundred times more distingue than esmeralda's beauty she's the quaintest-looking little creature that you ever set eyes on with the dearest funniest face father used to call her the ugliest child in galway he was so proud of her bless him bridgie sighed pensively and sylvia stared at her with curious eyes so far she had made the acquaintance of but one member of the o'shaughnessy family but it seemed as though they took the various trials and vicissitudes of life in a very different spirit from the people with whom she herself had associated instead of moaning over the inevitable they discerned the humour of the situation and in happy fashion turned the trial into a joke i wonder sighed sylvia to herself i wonder where the joke comes in in losing your hair i suppose she would say it was so cool to be bald not even to herself would she put into words the deeper crueler dread which lay hauntingly in the background of her mind end of chapter three Chapter Four of More About Pixie by Mrs. George de Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dread. The foot refused to heal, and one morning a well-known surgeon followed Doctor Horton into the sick room. The very sound of his name was as a death knell to the girl in the bed, 
but she controlled herself by a mighty effort and strained every nerve to watch the faces of her attendants during the examination which followed she knew that they would keep up appearances in her presence and so long as possible hide the worst from her knowledge but if she appeared unsuspicious they would perhaps be less careful and a stray word an interchange of glances might show the direction of their thoughts she lay perfectly still not even flinching with pain when the diseased bone was touched for the tension of the mind was so great as to eclipse bodily suffering but the cool business-like manner of the great surgeon gave no hint of his decision while dr horton was as cheerful whitey as serenely composed as on ordinary occasions the cage was replaced over the foot the bedclothes put in order a few pleasant commonplaces exchanged and the trio adjourned for consultation trained to their work of self-repression not one of them had given the slightest hint of what was feared but their precautions were undone by the thoughtless haste of the watcher outside miss munns was hovering about the landing awaiting the verdict and trembling at the thought of the news which she might have to send to her brother when the door opened and the surgeon came towards her dr horton and the nurse followed and before the door was closed behind them an eager whisper burst from her lips can you save it must you ampu before the word was completed the surgeon's hand was over her lips whitey brought to the door with a bang and three pale faces stared at each other in consternation had sylvia heard could she have overheard that was the question which was agitating every mind they strained their ears for a cry from the sick-room but no cry came whitey looked at the doctor and made a movement towards the door and he bent his head in assent yes go in as if you had forgotten something she may have fainted poor child it was enough to make her tears of remorse were standing in aunt margaret's eyes but she waited silently enough now while whitey re-entered the room and strolled across to the window to pick up the book in which she wrote the daily report she smiled at sylvia as she passed and sylvia looked at her quietly quite quietly and the dark eyes showed no signs of tears whitey went back to the doctors with lightened face and eased their minds by a definite assurance she heard nothing she's lying quite still and composed she cannot possibly have heard they turned and went downstairs to the dining-room sylvia heard their footsteps die away in the distance the opening and shutting of the door the brown eyes shone with unnatural brilliancy the hot hands were clasped tightly together beneath the sheet god she was crying deep down in her soul do you really mean it i've been very wicked often i've forgotten you and taken my own way but i'm so young only twenty-one don't make me lame i'll be good i'll think of other people i'll be grateful all my life don't make me lame think what it means to a girl like me to lose her foot i have no mother nor brothers nor sisters and father is far away it would be so dreadful to be shut up here and never never run about any more have pity on me don't make me lame it was a cry from the depths of her heart very different from the formal prayers which she was accustomed to offer morning and evening a plea for help such as she would have addressed to her dear earthly father in any of the minor difficulties of life but in this great crisis of her fate she must needs go straight to the fountain of comfort 
the great physician who was able to save the soul as well as the body all the rest of the day as she lay so quietly on her pillows she was talking to him pleading for deliverance setting forth pathetic girlish arguments why she should be spared the coming trial when the thought arose of many others younger than herself who were leading maimed lives she thrust the memory aside as something which could not be faced and her lips refused to utter the words which she had been taught to affix to her petitions nevertheless not my will but thine be done i can't say it lord i can't mean it she cried tremblingly not yet forgive me and be patient with me i'm so frightened and even as the prayer went up the assurance came into her soul that the heavenly father would understand and show towards her the divinest of sympathy and patience for some reason which she would have found difficult to explain to herself sylvia felt an intense disinclination to let her attendants know what she had overheard she perceived that they were more than usually tender towards herself and they on their part were puzzled by the quiet of the once restless patient she grumbled no more about small unpleasantnesses oh how small they seemed she was content to lie still and think her own thoughts and seemed to have lost all interest in the ordinary events of the day only once in the twenty-four hours did a smile light up the set face and that was when bridgie o'shaughnessy appeared for her afternoon visit and seated herself by the bedside on one of these occasions a week after the surgeon's first visit whitey went out for her daily walk and sylvia watched her go and peered anxiously round the screen to make sure that the door was really shut then she stretched out her hand and gripped bridgie by the wrist it was a very thin feeble-looking hand but the grip had nothing feeble about it it was almost painful in its strength and the brown eyes had a glazed misery of expression which made bridgie tremble at the thought of what was to come bridget o'shaughnessy you call yourself my friend will you tell me the truth i'll not promise that me dear i'll not deceive you about anything if i can help it but you are an invalid and there are some questions which you should not ask me only the doctor should answer them but sylvia went on with her story as if she had not heard the protest the other morning sir alfred heap came to see my foot he said very little about it to me and after examining it went out of the room to consult with dr horton aunt margaret was waiting for them on the landing and they were not quick enough in shutting the door i heard what she said to-morrow morning sir alfred is coming again bridgie is he going to cut off my foot he is not darling he is going to give you chloroform and do something to the bone to try to make it sound and healthy again and if that fails will he cut it off then he will operate again and go on trying as long as he dares and if everything else fails then yes sylvia said bridgie gently downstairs in the dining-room miss munns had been consulting with whitey as to how the patient was to be prepared for the ordeal of to-morrow and by whom the news should be broken whitey had taken the task upon herself with the unselfish heroism of her profession but her pretty face was worn with the strain of this long anxious case and bridgie's heart had ached for her in her painful task now in the midst of her own agitation she felt a thrill of unselfish joy that she had been able to take one burden at least from those heavily laden shoulders sylvia knew not only of the ordeal of the morrow but also of that nightmare dread of what might have to follow she had known it for a week past and had lain quietly on her bed with all the horror and misery of it locked up in her own heart such restraint seemed almost incredible to the outspoken irish nature but bridgie's words of admiration brought an added shade over the invalid's face 
no it was not bravery it was cowardice i was like an ostrich hiding my head in the ground for fear of what i might see i literally dare not ask until it came to the last moment oh bridgie what a week it has been going to sleep with the weight on my heart waking up and thinking what is it what is it and the shock of remembering afresh i lay and thought it all out never to be able to run nor bicycle nor skate nor dance nor even walk without crutches to dread going upstairs to be cut off from girls of my own age because i could not take part in their amusements to hear people say poor thing and look pitifully at me as i hobbled by i've tried to be resigned and take it like invalids in books but i can't i feel desperate bridgie suppose it was you how would you feel i should cry myself ill for two or three days and then brisk up and be thankful that if it was one foot it wasn't two said bridgie quaintly that is if i were quite certain about it but i never believe in disagreeable things until they have really happened hope for the best as long as you can you have clever doctors and nurses and you will have a better chance if you keep up your spirits sylvia shook her head hopelessly it's easy to be philosophic for someone else i could preach beautifully to you bridgie if you were lying here instead of me but the suspense is so hard to bear i feel as if i could not live through another week like the last have you ever known what it was to drag through the days with a nightmare of dread growing bigger and bigger nearer and nearer to look ahead and see your life robbed of the things you care for most to hope against hope while all the time your heart is sinking down 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 until it is just one great big ache clouding out the whole world yes i know said bridgie quietly i have never had a bad illness but my trouble came to me in a different way sylvia and my time of suspense was not days but weeks and months i might almost say years except that even my hopes had died out before that time arrived the two girls looked at each other intently and the blank depression on the invalid's face gave place to one of anxious sympathy you mean of course that it was a mental trouble could you tell me about it bridgie do you think i don't want to force your confidence but i am so interested in you and it would do me good to be sorry for someone beside myself was it a love affair i cared for him but i'm afraid he could not have liked me very much said bridgie sadly i have never spoken of him except to esmeralda and one other person but i don't mind telling you dear if it will be the least bit of help to you now we seem to know each other so well that it seems absurd to think we had not met two months ago it was just someone i met one time when i was visiting and when he was ordered abroad he asked if he might write while he was away i was very happy about it for i had never seen any one i liked so much and we wrote to each other regularly for over a year they were not love letters just quite ordinary sensible telling the news but there was always one little sentence in his which seemed to say more than the words and to tell me that he cared a great deal if a stranger had read it he would not have understood but i knew what he meant and i used to skim over the pages until i came to those few words and they were the whole letter to me looking back now i can see how i lived in expectation of mail day but suddenly his letters stopped when father was pronounced hopelessly ill i sent him a hurried note saying that we should have to leave the castle for all the money was gone and from that day to this i have heard no more it was very hard coming just then sylvia 
for the first few months i was not really uneasy though very disappointed i knew that a soldier's life is not always his own and that he might have been ordered to a part of the country where it was impossible to send off letters but then i read his name as taking part in some function in bombay and i knew that could be the case no longer i would not tell esmeralda to depress her in the midst of her happiness so i just sat tight and waited and the time was very long when it came near mail day my hopes would go up for it's my nature to be cheerful the postman would knock at the door and my heart would go head over heels with excitement and it would be a circular or a bill wanting payment another time he would not come at all and that was worse for one went on drearily hoping and hoping and pretending that the clock was fast now i forget mail days on purpose for it is nearly eighteen months since he wrote last and i have given up all hope of hearing sylvia drew a deep sigh and knitted her forehead i can't believe that any one could forget you when he had once cared you are so different from other girls it is most strange and mysterious do you think that perhaps you won't mind my suggesting it the money had some influence with him perhaps he thought you were an heiress at any rate that your people were rich and influential and when he heard that you were poor he may have changed no said bridgie decisively no i won't think it i won't let myself think so badly of any one for whom i've cared so much i don't know what his reasons were and perhaps i never shall but i would rather believe the best some people don't find it easy to remember when they are far away and he might have a delicacy in writing to say that he had forgotten if i had still been miss o'shaughnessy of knock i should have sent just one more letter to ask if anything was wrong but i had too much pride to obtrude myself as bridgie of nowhere i have no reason to believe that my letter went astray and even if it had he would have written again if he had wished to hear he is alive and well i know so much and i'm well too and very happy with my boys i had a bad time of it and the suspense had more to do with making me ill than the hard work of that summer but now i have faced the worst and have far too much to do to be able to mope boys are such cheering creatures they give you so much work the very darning of their socks is a distraction it would distract me in a very different way said sylvia with a smile End of chapter 4chapter five of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain an invitation the operation was successful and unsuccessful that is to say the fear of amputation was removed but it became abundantly evident that it would be a very long time before sylvia recovered the power of walking about with ease a few weeks earlier she would have been heartbroken at the prospect of a spell of crippledom but the greater troubles eclipsed the less and compared with that other paralyzing dread it was a passing inconvenience at which she could afford to smile poor child her first impulse on recovering from the chloroform had been to dive to the bottom of the bed to feel if the foot were still there and her elastic spirits went up with a bound as she listened to the surgeon's reassuring report she was perfectly willing to lie on the sofa and give up all idea of christmas festivities willing in fact in the relief and joy of the moment to promise anything and everything if only she might look forward to unimpaired strength in the future as for miss munns she rejoiced with grumbling as her custom was mingling thankful speeches with plaints for her own deprivations to the mingled distress and amusement of her hearers 
christmas was drawing near and there had been no time to prepare for the proper keeping of the festival for cook had been too much occupied with jellies and beef teas to have any time to spare there were no mince pies in the larder no plum puddings in their fat cloth wrappings no jars of lemon cheese no cakes no shortbread not so much as a common bun loaf and aunt margaret hung her head and felt that a blot had fallen upon her escutcheon i can't fancy christmas with bought mince pies she said sadly i've kept house for forty years and never failed to make four plum puddings one for christmas day one for new year one for company and one for easter some people make them without eggs nowadays but i keep to the old recipe my mother's plum puddings were quite famous among her friends of course my dear we have great cause for thankfulness and i should have had no appetite if you had lost your foot but it really upsets me to look at that larder how many pounds of mincemeat have you made miss o'shaughnessy may i ask sylvia was lying on the sofa in the drawing-room to which she had been carried in time for tea and bridgie was sitting beside her looking with wondering eyes at the muffled splendours which she now beheld for the first time she blushed as she heard the question and adroitly evaded an answer for to tell the truth she bought her pies from the pastry cook and congratulated herself on the saving of trouble oh indeed we get through a great deal for the boys think nothing of three pies at a sitting i'd be obliged to you miss munns if you would lend me your recipe for the pudding for my cook is not the cleverest in the world and as jack says there is no monotony about her results if she does a thing well three times there is all the more a chance that it will be wrong the fourth when you are encouraged to ask a friend to dinner aunt margaret sawed the air with her mittened hands and shook her cap in solemn denunciation method my dear method they won't take the trouble to measure the ingredients but just trust to chance so what can you expect you shall have the recipe with pleasure but if you take my advice you will look after the weighing yourself are you expecting any friends for the day or perhaps one of your sisters no we shall be quite alone my married sister wanted us all to go to ireland but the boys cannot spare the time and i will not leave them bridgie sighed and a shadow passed over her face it won't seem like christmas to have no coming nor going and esmeralda and pixie so far away i've been trying to think of a diversion for the boys but i might spare myself the trouble for i've no money to pay for it if i had the idea straightness of means is a great curtailer of pleasure said miss munns gazing solemnly into space over the edge of her spectacles in my own family we have had sad experiences of the kind my great-uncle was in most comfortable circumstances and kept his own brougham and peach houses before the failure of the glasgow bank they removed to syringa villas after that and did the washing at home i shall never forget calling upon emma the first tuesday that the clothes were hanging out to dry in the back garden and finding her in tears with the blinds drawn down she had a great deal of family pride had poor emma for her mother belonged to the leading circles in wolverhampton and the steam of clothes in the boiler is most depressing unless you have been brought up to it from a child george died soon after he never held up his head again and emmeline the daughter had a very good offer from a corn broker she was a fine-looking girl with black eyes and her poor father's nose she looked very well in the evening when she was dressed and had a colour and did she marry the corn-broker queried bridgie eagerly 
sylvia was flushed and frowning more than half ashamed of the old lady's disclosures fearful lest they might affect her own importance in the estimation of a friend who had lived in a castle and owned a sister who went to court and profoundly uninterested in emmeline and her destiny but bridgie was all animation and curiosity her grey eyes wide with anxiety as to the success of the corn-broker and his suit here indeed was a listener worth having and miss munns warmed to her task with even more than the usual enjoyment my dear you would hardly believe the time poor emma had with that girl she took a fancy to a bank clerk on two hundred a year and nothing would suit but she must be engaged to him he gave her a turquoise ring i remember a shabby thing that could not have cost more than a sovereign and emma was quite mortified when people asked to see it they were engaged for five years and she lost all her looks and he had a bicycling accident and hurt his right arm so badly that he could not write emma insisted that the engagement should be broken off but the stupid girl would not listen to reason she had a little legacy from her godmother about that time and his father allowed him something so they were married and went abroad to try a cure for his arm he is back at work again and they seem happy enough but it was a poor match for her and they can only afford one servant the corn-broker said he could never look at a girl again but he married one of the miss twemlows within a year perhaps you know the twemlows they are a very well-known family in their suburb no bridgie did not know them but her expression seemed to denote that she was quite ready to listen to their family history in addition to those which she had already heard but this was more than sylvia could bear and she hastened to interrupt the flow of her aunt's reminiscences you've not heard from aunt emma lately at least you've not told me of her letters i suppose you have not seen her while i've been ill miss munns pursed up her lips in a manner which seemed to imply that she was in possession of some weighty secret but from motives of prudence was resolved to conceal it from the world i have heard from her my dear i've not seen her as i said in my reply everything must give way to illness though i am very sorry indeed to think of her alone in the house emmeline can't leave the baby so it is only natural that her mother should want some companionship over christmas i would have had her here instead but the house is so upset that i am not prepared for visitors it is very pleasant meeting from time to time being contemporaries as we are and having gone through so many troubles together there's nothing i enjoy more than talking them over with your aunt emma and i'm grieved to disappoint her of course i made up my mind from the very first to say nothing about it to you now it was bridgie's turn to look blank and sylvia's to question anxiously do you mean that she invited you for christmas and that you refused because of me oh aunt margaret you must not do that you need a change and it would be a relief to have all arrangements taken off your hands whitey and i could manage quite well by ourselves do please change your mind and write to say that you will go my love i assure you that i considered the matter very carefully before i decided and that it is impossible for me to leave home i have promised nurse that she shall spend two days with her sister coming round each morning to attend to your foot and i should not like to disappoint her it is only natural that she should wish to be with her own friends i sympathize with her but i don't complain it is not your fault that your illness has upset my plans and it is my duty to be resigned and cheerful aunt margaret testified to her sense of duty by heaving a sigh of funereal proportions the while sylvia's brow became fretted with lines and she turned a glance of despair upon her friend to be condemned to spend christmas alone with aunt margaret in this mood of melancholy resignation to realize that she had deprived her of the happiness of talking over past troubles with poor dear emma 
to listen from morning to night to her transparently veiled repinings this was indeed a cheerful prospect for an invalid who might naturally have expected to receive the sympathy herself aren't you sorry for me the brown eyes asked bridgie mutely but lo bridgie was radiant her face one sparkle of animation her hands uplifted to hail the advent of a happy thought the diversion she cried rapturously the diversion i see it all and it is perfectly charming sylvia shall be the diversion she shall stay over the new year with us miss munce shall go to her friend and talk over old times nurse shall visit her sister and have a rest after her hard work i will look after sylvia and sylvia shall flirt with the boys and keep them happy it's a perfectly charming arrangement all round my dear cried aunt margaret in horrified protest against the last item on the programme but sylvia gave a chuckle of cheerful complacency and so far from being overcome looked so much revived by the prospect that there could be no doubt as to the expediency of the proposed visit so far as health at least was concerned miss munns went through the form of protesting but her objections were easily waved aside for to tell the truth she was only too ready to be persuaded and her objections had no deeper root than the belief that it was not polite to seize too eagerly on an invitation i could not think of it my dear such an upset for you you don't know how much work an invalid makes in the house she has to be carried up and down stairs and waited on hand and foot i have three big strong boys and you have only women in the house pat could put her in his pocket and not know there was anything there my dear how can you it would take up your spare room too and make so much ringing at the bell with nurse coming in the morning and doctor in the afternoon but what a lesson it would be to me to see them attending to her so useful for the next time the boys break their legs i love whitey and feel better for it every time i see her sweet kind face if you had had to prepare meals at all hours of the night and day you would be sick at the sight of a nurse however sweet she might look i don't see why you should be upset my dear for the sake of my friend dear miss munns i am thinking even more of my own friend it is selfishness which makes me want to have sylvia with me we would enjoy being together and talking over our troubles just as you do please let her come troubles my dear troubles has your cook given notice cried miss munns her mind flying at once to domestic matters and dwelling thereon with accustomed enjoyment she had so many stories to tell of cooks who had left their places immediately before christmas and of the tragic consequences which followed that the original subject of discussion took a secondary position in her thoughts and when bridgie began placidly to discuss arrangements she fell into the trap with innocent alacrity sylvia could hardly believe her ears it seemed quite too good to be true the week's holiday held out glorious possibilities of enjoyment and she began at once to count the hours which must elapse before her departure End of chapter five